Part One of The Dragon Queen of Jupiter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This story was first published in Planet Stories, Summer of 1941. The Dragon Queen of Jupiter by Lee Douglas Brackett Part One. Tex stirred uneasily where he lay on the parapet, staring into the heavy Jupiterian fog. The greasy moisture ran down the fort wall, lay rank on his lips. With a sigh for the hot, dry air of Texas, and a curse for the adventure thirst that made him leave it, he shifted his short, steel-hard body and wrinkled his sandy red brows in the never-ending effort to see. A stifled cough turned his head. He whispered, "'Hi, Bresca.' The Martian grinned and lay down beside him. His skin was wind-burned like Texas, his black eyes nestled in wrinkles caused by squinting against sun and blowing dust. For a second they were silent feeling the desert like a bond between them. Then Bresca, mastering his cough, grunted, "'They're an hour late now. What's the matter with them?' Tex was worried, too. The regular dawn attack of the Swamp Dwellers was long overdue. "'Reckon they're thinking up some new tricks,' he said. "'I sure wish our relief would get here. I could use a vacation.' Bresca's teeth showed a cynical flash of white. If they don't come soon, it won't matter. At that, starving is pleasanter than beetle bombs or green snakes. Hey, Tex, here comes the skipper. Captain John Smith. Smith was a common name in the Volunteer Legion, crawled along the catwalk. There were new lines of strain on the officer's gaunt face, and Tex's uneasiness grew. He knew that supplies were running low. Repairs were urgently needed. Was the relief going to come at all? But Captain Smith's pleasant English voice was as calm as though he were discussing cricket scores in a comfortable London club. Any sign of the beggars, Tex? No, sir, but I got a feeling. Oh, yes, we all have. Well, keep it sharp. A scream cut him short. It came from below in the square compound. Tex shivered, craning down through the rusty netting covering the well. He'd heard screams like that before. A man ran across the greasy stones, tearing at something on his wrist. Other men ran to help him, the ragged remnant of the force that had marched into New Fort Washington three months before, the first garrison. The tiny green snake on the man's wrist grew incredibly. By the time the first men reached it, it had whipped a coil around its victim's neck. Faster than the eye could follow, it shifted its fangs from wrist to throat. The man seemed suddenly to go mad. He drew his knife and slashed at his comrades, screaming, keeping them at bay. Then, abruptly, he collapsed. The green snake, now nearly ten feet long, whipped free and darted toward a drainage tunnel. Shouting men surrounded it, drawing rapid-fire pistols, but Captain Smith called out, "'Don't waste your ammunition, men!' Startled faces looked up. And in that second of respite the snake coiled and butted its flat-nosed head against the grating. In a shower of rust flakes it fell outward, and the snake was gone like a streak of green fire. Tex heard Bresca cursing in a low undertone. A sudden silence had fallen on the compound. Men fingered the broken grating, white-faced as they realized what it meant. There would be no metal for repairs until the relief column came. It was hard enough to bring bare necessities over the wild terrain, and air travel was impracticable due to the miles-thick clouds and magnetic vagaries. There would be no metal, no ammunition. Tex swore. Reckon I'll never get used to those varmints, Captain. The rattlers back home was just kids' toys. Simple enough, really. 
Captain Smith spoke absently, his gray eyes following the sag of the rusty netting below. The green snakes, like the planarians, decrease evenly in size with starvation. They also have a vastly accelerated metabolism. When they get food, which happens to be blood, they simply shoot out to their normal size, and injected venom causes their victims to fight off help until the snake has fed. Breska snarled. Cute trick the swamp men thought up, starving those things and then slipping them in on us through the drain pipes. They're so tiny you miss one every once in a while. And then you get that. Tex nodded toward the corpse. I wonder who the war chief is. I'd sure like to get a look at him. Yes, said Captain Smith. So would I. He turned to go, crawling below the parapet. You never knew what might come out of the fog at you if you showed a target. The body was carried out to the incinerator, as there was no ceremony about burials in this heat. A blob of white caught Texas' eye as a face strained upward, watching the officer through the rusty netting. Tex grunted. Huh, there's your countryman, Bresca. I'd say he isn't so sold on the idea of making Venus safe for colonists. Oh, lay off him, Tex, Bresca said, strangled briefly by a fit of coughing. He's just a kid. He's homesick, and he's got the wheezies like me. This lowland air isn't good for us. But just wait until we knock some sense into these white devils and settle the high plateau. If he finished, Tex didn't hear him. The red-haired westerner was staring stiffly upward, clawing for his gun. He hadn't heard or seen a thing, and now the fog was full of thundering wings and shrill screams of triumph. Below the walls, where the ground mist hung in stagnant whirls, a host of half-seen bodies routed out of the wilderness into which no civilized man had ever gone. The rapid-fire pistol bucked and snarled in Texas' hand. Captain Smith, lying on his belly, called orders in his crisp, unhurried voice. Sea battery on the northeast corner cut in with a chattering roar, spraying explosive bullets upward, followed by the other three whose duty it was to keep the air clear. Texas' heart thumped. Powder smoke bit his nostrils. Bresca began to whistle through his teeth a song that Tex had taught him called The Lone Prairie. The ground-strafing crew got their guns unlimbered and mud began to splash up from below. But it wasn't enough. The gun emplacements were only half-manned, the remainder of the depopulated garrison having been off-duty down in the compound. The Jupiterians were swarming up the incline on which the fort stood attacking from the front and fanning out along the sides when they reached firm ground. The morasses to the east and west were absolutely impassable, even to the swamp men, which was what made Fort Washington a strategic and envied stronghold. Tex watched the attackers with mingled admiration and hatred. They had guts, the kind the Red Indians must have had back in the old days in America. They had cruelty, too and a fiendish genius for thinking up tricks. If the relief column didn't come soon, there might be one trick too many, and the way would be left open for a breakthrough. The thin, hard-held line of frontier posts could be flanked, cut off, and annihilated. Tex shuddered to think what that would mean for the colonists, already coming hopefully into the fertile plateaus. A sluggish breeze rolled the mist south into the swamps, and Tex got his first clear look at the enemy. His heart jolted sharply. This was no mere raid. This was an attack. Hordes of tall warriors swarmed toward the walls, pale-skinned giants from the sunless land with snow-white hair coiled in war clubs at the base of the skull. They wore girdles of reptile skin, and carried bags slung over their brawny shoulders. In their hands they carried clubs and crude bows. Beside them, roaring and hissing, came their war-dogs, semi-erect reptiles with prehensile paws, their powerful tails armed with artificial spikes of bone. 
Scaling ladders banged against the walls. Men and beasts began to climb, covered by companions on the ground who hurled grenades of bait mud from their bags. "'Beetle bombs!' yelled Tex. "'Watch yourselves!' He thrust one ladder outward and fired point-blank into a dead white face. A flying clay ball burst beside the man who fired the nearest ground gun, and in a split second every inch of bare skin was covered by a sheath of huge scarlet beetles. Texas' freckled face hardened. The man's screams knifed upward through the thunder of wings. Tex put a bullet carefully through his head and tumbled the body over the parapet. Some of the beetles were shaken off, and he glimpsed bone already bare and gleaming. Missiles rained down from above, beetle bombs, green snakes made worm size by starvation. Men were swarming up from the compound now, but the few seconds of delay almost proved fatal. The aerial attackers were plain in the thinning mists, lightly built men mounted on huge things that were half bird, half lizard. The rusty netting jerked, catching the heavy bodies of man and lizard shot down by the guns. Tex held his breath. That net was all that protected them from a concerted dive attack that would give the natives a foothold inside the walls. A gun in a battery choked into silence, rust somewhere in the mechanism. No amount of grease could keep it out. Bresca swore sulfurously and stamped a small green thing flat. Red beetles crawled along the stones. Thank God the things didn't fly. Men fought and died with the snakes. Another gun suddenly cut out. Tex fired steadily at fierce white heads thrust above the parapet. The man next to him stumbled against the infested stones. The voracious scarlet flood surged over him, and in forty seconds his uniform sagged on naked bones. Bresca's shout warned Tex aside as a lizard fell on the catwalk. Its rider pitched into the stream of beetles and began to die. Wings beat close overhead, and Tex crouched, aiming upward. His freckled face relaxed in a stare of utter unbelief. She was beautiful pearl-white thighs circling the gray-green barrel of her mount, silver hair streaming from under a snakeskin diadem set with the horns of a swamp rhino, a slim body clad in girdle and breastplates of iridescent scales. Her face was beautiful, too, like a mask cut from pearl. But her eyes were like pale green flames, and the silver brows above them were drawn into a straight bar of anger. Tex had never seen such cold, fierce hate in any living creature, even a rattler coiled to strike. His gun was aimed, yet somehow he couldn't pull the trigger. When he had collected his wits she was gone, swooping like a stunting flyer through the fire of the guns. She bore no weapons, only what looked like an ancient hunting horn. Tex swore very softly. He knew what that horned diadem meant. This was the war chief. The men had reached the parapet just in time. Tex blasted the head from a miniature Tyrannosaurus, dodged the backlash of the spiked tail, and threw down another ladder. Guns snarled steadily, and corpses were piling up at the foot of the wall. Tex saw the woman urge her flying mount over the pit of the compound, saw her searching out the plan of the place, the living quarters, the water tanks, the kitchen, the radio room. Impelled by some inner warning that made him forget all reluctance to war against a woman, Tex fired. The bullet clipped a tress of her silver hair. Eyes like pale green flames burned into his for a split second, and her lips drew back from reptilian teeth, white, small, and pointed. Then she whipped her mount into a swift spiral climb and was gone, flashing through streamers of mist and powder smoke. A second later Tex heard the mellow notes of her horn, and the attackers turned and vanished into the swamp. As quickly as that it was over. Yet Tex, 
panting and wiping the sticky sweat from his forehead, wasn't happy. He wished she hadn't smiled. Men with blowtorches scoured the fort clean of beetles and green snakes. One party sprayed oil on the heaps of bodies below and fired them. The netting was cleared, their own dead burned. Tex, who was a corporal, got his men together and his heart sank as he counted them. Thirty-two left to guard a fort that should be garrisoned by seventy. Another attack like that and there might be none. Yet Tex had an uneasy feeling that the attack had more behind it than the mere attempt to carry the fort by storm. He thought of the woman whose brain had evolved all these hideous schemes, the beetle bombs, the green snakes. She hadn't risked her neck for nothing, flying in the teeth of four batteries. He had salvaged the lock of silver hair his bullet had clipped. Now it seemed almost a stir with malign life in his pocket. Captain John Smith came out of the radio room. The officer's gaunt face was oddly still, his gray eyes like chips of stone. "'At ease,' he said. His pleasant English voice had that same quality of dead stillness. "'Word has just come from regional headquarters. The swamp men have attacked in force east of us and have heavily besieged Fort Nelson. Our relief column has been sent to relieve them. More men are being readied, but it will take at least two weeks for any help to reach us.' Tex heard the hard-caught breaths as the news took the men like a jolt in the belly, and he saw eyes sliding furtively aside to the dense black smoke pouring up from the incinerator, to the water tanks, and to the broken grating. Somebody whimpered. Tex heard Breska snarl, "'Shut up!' The whimperer was Kuna the young Martian who had stared white-faced at the captain a short while before. Captain Smith went on. Our situation is serious. However, we can hold out another fortnight. Supplies will have to be rationed still further, and we must conserve ammunition and manpower as much as possible. But we must all remember this. Help is coming. Headquarters are doing all they can. With the money they have, said Bresca sourly in Texas ear. Damn the taxpayers! And we've only to hold out a few days longer. After all, we volunteered for this job. Jupiter is a virgin planet. It's savage, uncivilized, knowing no law but brute force. But it can be built into a great new world. And if we do our jobs well, some day these swamps will be drained. The jungles cleared, the natives civilized. The people of Earth and Mars will find new hope and freedom here. It's up to us." The captain's grim, gaunt face relaxed, and his eyes twinkled. "'Pity we're none of us using our right names,' he said, "'because I think we're going to get them in the history books.' The men laughed. The tension was broken. "'Dismissed,' said Captain Smith, and strolled off to his quarters. Tex turned to Breska. The Martian, his leathery dark face set, was gripping the arms of his young countryman, the only other Martian in the fort. Listen, hissed Breska, his teeth showing white like a dog's fangs. Get hold of yourself. If you don't, you'll get into trouble. Kuna trembled, his wide black eyes watching the smoke from the bodies roll up into the fog. His skin lacked the leathery burn of Breska's. Tex guessed that he came from one of the canal cities where things were softer. "'I don't want to die,' said Kuna softly. "'I don't want to die in this rotten fog.' "'Take it easy, kid,' Tex rubbed the sandy red stubble on his chin and grinned. "'The skipper'll get us through okay. He's aces.' "'Maybe.' Kuna's eyes wandered round to Tex. But why should I take the chance? He was shaken suddenly by a fit of coughing. When he spoke again his voice had risen and grown tight as a violin string. Why should I stay here and cough my guts out for something that will never be anyway? Because, said Breska grimly, 
On Mars there are men and women breaking their backs and their hearts to get enough bread out of the deserts. You're a city man, Kuna. Have you ever seen the famines that sweep the dry lands? Have you ever seen men with their ribs cutting through the skin, women and children with faces like skulls? That's why I'm here, coughing my guts out in this stinking fog. Because people need land to grow food on and water to grow it with. Kuna's dark eyes rolled and Tex frowned. He'd seen that same starry look in the eyes of cattle on the verge of a stampede. What's the bellyache? he said sharply. You volunteered, didn't you? I, I didn't know what it meant, Kuna whispered and coughed. <coughs> I'll <coughs> die if I stay here. I don't want to die. What, Bresca said gently, are you going to do about it? Kuna smiled. She was beautiful, wasn't she, Tex? The Texan started. I, I reckon she was, kid. What of it? You have a lock of her hair. I saw you pick it from the net. The net'll go out soon, like the grating did. Uh, there won't be anything to keep the snakes and beetles off of us. She'll sit up there and watch us die and laugh. But I won't die. I tell you, I, I won't. He shuddered in Bresca's hands and began to laugh. The laugh rose to a thin, high scream like the wailing of a panther. Bresca hit him accurately on the point of the jaw. Cafard, he grunted, and some of the men came running. He'll come round all right. He dragged Kuna to the dormitory and came back, doubled up with coughing from the exertion. Tex saw the pain in his dark face. Say, he murmured, you'd better ask for leave when the relief gets here. If it gets here, gasped the Martian. That attack at Fort Nelson was just a feint to draw off our reinforcements. Tex nodded. Even if the varmints broke through there, they'd be stopped by French River and the broken hills beyond it. A map of Fort Washington's position formed itself in his mind, the stone block house commanding a narrow tongue of land between strips of impassable swamp, barring the way into the valley. The valley led back into the uplands, splitting so that one arm ran parallel to the swamps for many miles. To the fierce and active men like the swamp dwellers, it would be no trick to swarm down that valley, take Fort Albert and Fort George by surprise in a rear attack, and leave a gap in the frontier defenses that could never be closed in time. And then hordes of white-haired warriors would swarm out, led by that beautiful fury on the winged lizard, rouse the more lethargic pastoral tribes against the colonists, and sweep out land peoples from the face of Jupiter. They could do it, too, Tex muttered. They outnumber us a thousand to one. And, added Bresca viciously, the lousy taxpayers won't even give us decent equipment to fight with. Tex grinned. <laughs> Armies are always stepchildren. I guess the sheep just never did like the goats, anyhow. He shrugged. Better keep an eye on Kuna. He might try something. What could he do? If he deserts, they'll catch him trying to skip out. If the savages don't get him first, he won't try it. But in the morning, Kuna was gone, and the lock of silver hair in Texas' pocket was gone with him. End of Part One